Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to our first lecture uh, in Psychology 1000. Uh, in this lecture, we'll talk about the history of psychology. Uh, so this is obviously a, a big subject, uh, and to give it a framework, we need to talk about how people thought about psychology before it was even called that. Uh, how did people think about the mind uh, or think about behavior in the distant past? And we'll catch up to modern era pretty quickly. Uh, so today we'll be talking about ancient history up through early modern history. So by way of overview, uh, we're looking at the history of psychology. Uh, and in particular, we're going to pay attention to two terms. Psychology, the study of the mind, uh, and behavior. That is what people do, or more generally, what an organism does. So even things like rats, monkeys, cats, dogs, uh, even small organisms, they all behave, they all make actions. Uh, and what psychology is often trying to do uh, is, is make a connection between what people think, what their experiences are, what they perceive, and what they do. So the idea of trying to understand behavior, understanding why people do the things they do. And a big part of that, of course, is the mind. Uh, once we're talking about things beyond reflexes, which we don't really have any control over, uh, the mind starts to come into play. How does the mind generate behavior? How does it choose amongst possible behaviors which one it will actually exhibit? Uh, so to do that in a historical framework, we'll talk about some important figures in psychology, uh, some people that have really influenced the development of this field. And in, in so doing, uh, we'll talk about some historical sort of stages. Now that these don't have names like the Renaissance era, we don't, we don't name the era, it's not the time period, uh, these more generally tend to be sort of ways of approaching the problem. So we'll talk about things like dualism, we'll talk about things like behaviorism, structuralism, functionalism. Uh, and so these are all ways of thinking about the problem. And each one has its pros and cons. Uh, I'm not going to end this story telling you that we now have the perfect approach to psychology that answers all the questions. Because we don't. Uh, that doesn't exist. And it may never exist. Uh, but these are different approaches that these historical figures have tried. And then, of course, everyone observes what the results are and then moves on to the next stage. Comes up with, somebody comes up with a new idea that maybe addresses some of the problems that the old stage had. Uh, so in particular, what we're going to do is first define our terms. I've already done that for behavior. Uh, but we'll have a few terms here in this lecture. And the idea is not to get bogged down in terminology, in semantics. Uh, but these are important ways of uh, these, are, these are important for understanding what psychology examines, and again, how we approach the problem. Uh, and we'll look at different individuals through history. Uh, and the idea is not to really dwell on the biographies involved. Uh, we'll, we'll really just go over the details that are relevant for what they contributed to that stage of psychology. Uh, and then we'll look at the stage itself. What, did, what was stage involved with? What does the stage mean? What does the term mean? Uh, and again, what are the pros and cons? What did it contribute? What did it not contribute? What, what was it not able to accomplish in trying to understand the mind? And a lot of these stages and some of these terms really deal with deep questions in psychology. Uh, so about the nature of the mind. How is it that people think? How is it that the mind does what it does? And some of these questions have, we think, been answered. Some haven't. Uh, and so we'll talk about each of those. Uh, so first things first, we have to, again, define our terms. So what is psychology? Uh, so briefly, psychology is the study of the mind uh, and behavior and the relationship between the two, how each one affects the other. Uh, the mind, of course, is... is our internal experience. We'll get into that here in a minute. Uh, and behavior is what organisms do. And how, do those, how does one produce the other? Uh, so we have this cartoon of what's really the brain, uh, which as we'll see, our, our evolving understanding of the brain uh, has led us to think that, that the mind really resides in the brain. 
uh, that to a certain degree the mind is what the brain does. And that's historically been debatable, and, and perhaps it still is to a certain degree. Um, less than we think now, we understand more and more about the brain. Uh, but in some way, the mind eventually produces behavior, produces some action on the part of the individual. And psychology is the study of that relationship. Uh, it is, first and foremost, a science. Uh, so we'll see things started off not so scientifically. Uh, but as we progress, certainly in the last hundred years, psychology has become increasingly scientific. It employs a scientific method. Uh, it tries to make a hypothesis, create, design an experiment, or at least a system of observations to answer that hypothesis, either support it or disconfirm it. Uh, and it tries to gather evidence and come up with a conclusion based on that evidence that says something about how the mind works, something that says something about behavior and how behavior is produced. So it is a science. We want to we want to view the whole course really through that scientific framework, trying to understand how the mind works, how behavior is produced, uh, based on evidence, uh, based on theory that has been perhaps supported by evidence. Uh, so that's really the, the the idea here is to, is to think of psychology as a science. Uh, so what is behavior? I've already answered this one. Uh, but behavior is a set of actions. So it's what an organism does. And of course here we focus more on people. Uh, there's been a lot of ex important experimental work that deals with non-human animals. Humans are, of course, animals. Uh, but we focus on people for the most part. But the actions have to be observable. Uh, and so hidden thoughts, for example, you might think of that perhaps as an action. So a feeling, well, that's something that's changed about myself. I'm aware of it. Is it an action? Um, so behavior is observable actions, things that we can see an organism doing. Uh, the other question, of course, is what is the mind? Uh, well, the mind is a combination of phenomena. Uh, so certainly perception is part of that, and perception is how we process data from our senses. What do we think is going on in the world based on the sensory information that we're getting? And of course, our senses aren't always reliable. And even when the senses are reliable, the way we interpret sensory data, not always the correct interpretation. Uh, and so this gets to the idea that perception and the mind in general uh, is a subjective experience. So everyone may experience the same phenomena differently. Uh, and so that subjective experience, what we feel, how we respond to a situation, not behaviorally, but mentally. Uh, so what is our subjective impression of the world around us, uh, of our own actions, of our own thoughts, uh, of feelings? So feelings are an important part of the mind. Emotions, and we'll have a unit on emotions. But those are internal states. Those are subjective experiences. You can feel something without anyone else being aware of it or being able to observe it. Now, you might have outward signs of those feelings, and many feelings have behaviors that accompany them, uh, but the feeling itself is an internal experience, as are thoughts. So, of course, we all have a stream of consciousness. Different thoughts are popping into your head from time to time. Uh, it depends on what you're paying attention to, for example, uh, what you're thinking about, what you're feeling. Uh, and so thoughts are part of the mind. Memories. Uh, so we certainly know that memories seem to be stored in the brain, uh, but that subjective experience of recalling a memory, of remembering information, that's part of the mind. Things like decisions. How do we decide something? How do we choose? That's part of the mind. Uh, and of course, that, that will eventually get us into a whole debate about where decisions come from. Uh, do we have things like free will? So if you can predict what someone's going to do, and that's partially the goal of psychology, uh, if you can predict someone's behavior, in what sense are they really choosing those actions if you already know they're going to do them? Interesting question. Uh, and of course, things like personality. So even exposed to the same environment, the same people, observing the same behaviors, different people might respond in different ways based on personality, what makes them an individual. And so that's arguably part of the mind as well.
So going way back, as, as early as we can in terms of history, uh, the first, some of the first people to really think about the mind uh, were the ancient Greeks, uh, and in particular, ancient Greek philosophers. So, for example, Plato, one of the most famous philosophers, a uh, student of Socrates, as far as we know. Uh, Plato, in addition to his philosophical works, also had thoughts about how the mind works. Uh, what does the mind do? What is it composed of? Uh, and so Plato, in thinking about the mind, had this idea of what we call nativism, uh, the idea that we're born with, with knowledge, uh, that we already know how to do things, that we already have memories of a sort, we've already learned things, uh, that a lot of this is innate, that is, it doesn't need to be taught. Uh, and and that's, that's a, a fine idea. You can think of examples of behaviors that seem to be innate. Uh, so, for example, when a baby is hungry, it cries. Uh, babies don't need to learn through observation. They don't need to, need, need to be taught what hunger is or how to cry. They seem to happen to know, to know that inherently. Uh, they don't need to observe an adult or even another child getting hungry. Uh, they just get hungry and they cry. So that sort of connection between uh, a physical state, a feeling of hunger, and a behavior, crying, that seems to not have to be learned. So there's a, there's a certain point uh, in, in, in what Plato is saying. And more complex behaviors occur in other organisms as well. Uh, think about a spider building a web. A spider doesn't need to observe other spiders to know how to build a web. That, that, that knowledge seems to be innate. A spider raised by itself will still be able to build a perfectly good web. Uh, but then along comes Aristotle uh, and a doctrine known as philosophical empiricism, which really just says that a person is born and they're a blank slate, a tabula rasa, uh, is, is the, the, term, the fancy term for that. Uh, that people don't really know anything when they're born, everything is learned. And there's a certain point here, too, uh, because Obviously, babies can't speak when they're born, uh, but even if their parents know one language, that child, if it's not exposed to that language as they grow up, they won't speak it. They're, they speak the language that they're exposed to. Uh, and so, obviously, some things are learned. Similarly, you don't, you don't come out uh, of the womb knowing certain skills. You have to learn skills. And so, that knowledge seems not to be innate. That has to be learned. Uh, and so that was that was Aristotle's contribution. Uh, now again, these were these were these were sort of ancient thinkers. They weren't using the scientific method. They weren't designing experiments. Uh, in fact, Aristotle thought the brain was nothing more than a device for cooling the blood, uh, which we now know is wrong. Uh, so we shouldn't think these guys were omniscient. They didn't know, have all the answers, but they were thinking about the problem. And of course, the two schools of thought here are often what's referred to now as nature versus nurture. So how much of our behavior, how much of our personality, how much of our mind is inborn, nature, and how much do we have to learn, how much it is a function of our environment, and that's the nurture side. Uh, and of course, we also have this distinction between philosophy, which is what Plato and Aristotle were practicing, uh, and science. So science employs the scientific method, makes hypotheses, tests them, and then either confirms or disconfirms those hypotheses. And, and a lot of the sciences, not just psychology, uh, have their roots in philosophy uh, because science hasn't been around as long as philosophy has, frankly. Uh, and so a lot of those early thinkers on, on various subjects from psychology through physics uh, were really philosophers. They were, they were sort of thinking about the problem um, maybe making some observations, but nothing particularly principled. Uh, and so we see this transition from the ancient world, where philosophers were the ones coming up with these ideas, uh, to the more modern world, where it's really within the realm of science. Okay, we're going to skip forward hundreds of years. Uh, one of the big schools of thought uh, in the what we call the early modern era, sort of post-Renaissance, uh, is Rene Descartes, uh, and an idea that was known as dualism. 
So we see Descartes here, picture to the right. Uh, and what Descartes was thinking about, uh, and Descartes was still more of a philosopher, but a more modern philosopher, uh, was the separation of the body and the mind. So we have a physical body, uh, but then we also have the mind, our internal experience. Uh, and of course, we have feelings and thoughts. And the body is, is just sort of stuff. It's matter. Uh, and the, can matter think, can matter feel, can matter have experiences. Uh, and certainly this ran up against the idea of having a spirit or soul. And of course, that's a lot of the world that Descartes was coming from, uh, was a religious world. And so the idea of the soul was a central part uh, of life there. Uh, and so the, the, the idea that the body, which is just physical stuff, uh, was separate from the soul, which was non-physical, uh, you had to figure out some way to connect the two. And so that was Descartes' position, uh, was that there was the body, which was physical, and there was the spirit or the soul or the mind, uh, which was non-physical, could survive the death of the body. Uh, but there was a problem there, because the, the, the mind being non-physical clearly still has an effect on the body. So if we, if we feel something, our body can exhibit the signs of those feelings, like crying if we're sad, or smiling if we're happy. Uh, the body also makes actions. So in our mind, we decide to do something, and our body physically does it. Uh, so it still leaves open the question of where is that connection? How does something non-physical cause something in the physical body? Uh, and there's the idea of what's called the homunculus. It's not an important term for now. But the idea is you had some sort of decision maker that was non-physical but could still affect the body in a physical way. Uh, and so there was really no answering this question. There's never been a satisfying answer to that question. How do you have something non-physical affect the physical body? Uh, then you have people like Franz Joseph Gall come along uh, and, and he's not the only one that thought this, uh, but he thought that the brain is really what produces the mind. The brain was the organ where thought was coming from. And some of the ancient Greeks thought that as well. Aristotle, again, didn't think that the brain was that important, or at least that it was involved in thinking. Um, but some of the thinkers, even at Aristotle's time, and certainly afterwards, uh, thought that the brain was really important. That the brain somehow produced the mind. The brain was sort of what the mind does. Uh, and so Gall comes along, uh, and acknowledges the idea that the mind is sort of created by the brain. Uh, but he had, in addition to other empirical work, he had the sort of uh, field that's associated with him of phrenology. And that was a little bit unfortunate, sort of a misstep of psychology. Uh, phrenology was the idea that the brain, the different parts of the brain, would be larger or smaller depending on the personality uh, and the abilities of the person. And these would show up as bumps or depressions on the skull, so you could feel the outside of a person's head and determine facts about their, their personality, about the sort of person they were. Uh, we certainly know that's not true. Those claims are mostly baseless. Uh, it was a fad for a while, but now no longer, thankfully. Uh, However, it did have sort of an important kernel of truth. Uh, Gall just took it you know, in the wrong direction. And that is the local, localization of function. Not only does the brain produce the mind, uh, but the different parts of the brain do different things. The brain isn't just one homogenous organ where everything sort of resides everywhere. There are particular parts to the brain. Uh, and the distinction between those parts is the distinction between different functions. Now, we'll see later on that we, can't take, we shouldn't take that idea too far. Uh, but we know that certain parts of the brain are critical for certain capacities. Things like the hippocampus in the brain or it seem, to be, uh, seem to be important for memory. The, the rearmost portions of the brain are very important for vision. Uh, and if you lose different parts of the brain, you might lose certain functions. Okay, moving forward into the 19th century, the 1800s, uh, you have individuals like Paul Broca, uh, 
uh, pictured here. Uh, and Broca had one famous patient in particular uh, who lost a portion of his brain and lost the ability to speak coherently. Could still understand, could still otherwise function normally, but could not speak. And so this is a particular region of the brain that seemed to be critical for the function of speech. Uh, in fact, there's an area of the brain known as Broca's area. It's named after him. Uh, and so now we're starting to get a more accurate I, uh, a more accurate picture of this localization of function that we saw sort of a wrong version uh, under Gall. Uh, then you also have individuals like Hermann von Helmholtz uh, who really started to, to get sort of hard-nosed about science and introducing the scientific method to psychology. Uh, before that, it had been somewhat scientific, it had been based on observation, uh, but not so much based on controlled experiment. Uh, and so Helmholtz is often credited with bringing the scientific method full-fledged to psychology. Uh, and one of the things he introduced was the idea of what we call reaction time. Uh, reaction time is the delay between receiving a stimulus and making a physical response. Uh, so if you're told to press a button as soon as a flash of light comes on a computer screen, the delay between the flash and you're pressing the button is your reaction time. Uh, and before that point, people thought mental processes were more or less instantaneous. Uh, that your perception was instantaneous, that it, obviously some actions took a while, but all the processing involved in generating the action, that all happened in an instant. And von Helmholtz proved that, well, no, it takes a while uh, to respond to a stimulus, to process it. Uh, so stimuli out on the extremities take longer to reach the brain uh, than stimuli closer into the head. Uh, and so, obviously, transmitting information from distant parts of the body takes a while. Uh, we'll learn more later about how that transmission occurs. Uh, but it's not instantaneous. It is a very fast process by most standards, uh, but it doesn't happen in an instant. And so von Helmholtz proved that with his reaction time experiments. Uh, there's also Wilhelm Wundt. Uh, and here, uh, Wundt, or Wundt, uh, placed an emphasis on the importance of the conscious mind. Uh, that is, that it wasn't entirely about behavior, that the important part of the mind uh, was mental processes, the conscious mind, what we're aware of, what we're feeling, what we're thinking. Uh, and so he posited a theory known as structuralism. And that is that the idea of consciousness could be broken down into component parts. There were different thoughts, different feelings. Uh, and that each of these was an element of consciousness that could be separated out and studied. And, and, but but Wundt's method was through introspection. That is, the person sitting there thinking about their subjective experience and reporting it. So describing your feelings describing what's on your mind at a given moment. Uh, and this is very hard to observe, very hard to prove. Um, it's also very hard to describe. Think about the last time you felt angry and try and describe that to someone without referring to other feelings or just using synonyms for angry. It's very hard to do. Uh, so there was a response to this known as functionalism. And this was largely put forth by William James. And the authors of your textbook start chapter one with William James. We've started here sort of chronologically with the, with the ancient Greeks and moved forward. Uh, but William James is, to many minds, one of the most important figures in psychology. Uh, and, and your textbook actually shows this picture of him. So I've shown you the one up top here, um, which is how you usually see William James, but your, your authors uh, have shown you this bottom picture where he looks sort of like a, a cowboy librarian or something. Um, and the point they're making, I think, uh, is that William James did not set off to harshly found but contribute to the field of psychology. He tried a bunch of different things, only discovered that, that what he was passionate about didn't really exist as a discipline at the time. And so it took a while to figure out what he wanted to do. Uh, and so he was not always this distinguished elder figure uh, in psychology, that he started off sort of struggling 
and being unsure of what he wanted to do with life. Uh, but thankfully, he ended up in psychology uh, and noticed that there was a big drawback of structuralism, the idea that the conscious mind is broken into components that can then be observed and described. And that problem was introspection, that you're depending on people to reliably and accurately describe what's going on in their minds. Uh, and, and James thought that was a sort of a futile endeavor. Uh, and so he founded functionalism. And functionalism uh, is the idea that we should think about mental processes and behavior in terms of what they do for the individual. What is the function of that mental process? What is the function of that behavior? Uh, and when we talk about the function of behaviors and mental processes, uh, one of the important components here is natural selection. And that sort of frames James's thinking uh, on where behaviors uh, and, and mental processes came from. The natural selection, of course, posited by Charles Darwin, or at least refined by him, uh, saying that if a behavior or a component of the body didn't serve a purpose, didn't help the organism survive, then it wouldn't have been passed on to subsequent generations. That the mind and its component parts must have individual functions, must be useful, must help the individual survive. And so that's what James was saying with functionalism. It's saying that, that each individual part, each thing we do, each way of responding to the world, must have some sort of useful function. Uh, so James made a big contribution with functionalism. Uh, and then another individual, G. Stanley Hall, uh, took it sort of a step further, looking at evolutionary history uh, and looking at development. And Hall's idea was uh, that as we develop from babies, that we sort of go through the evolutionary history of our species. At first, we have very limited capacity, both mentally and physically. But as we develop, we start adding functions. And the idea was that we more or less add those functions uh, as in the same order uh, as our ancient ancestors did. Uh, at first, babies, of course, can't speak. But as they grow, and neither could our predecessors, if you go far enough back in evolutionary history. But eventually, babies develop that ability. Uh, they can't walk upright, or neither could our ancient ancestors. They develop that ability. Uh, couldn't reason. Only fairly recently has the ability to reason and think logically uh, arrived in our psychological repertoire. Uh, so that was Hall's idea, was that the childhood development sort of recap recapitulates our evolutionary history. Now I'm going to switch gears here a little bit because no discussion of the history of psychology would be complete uh, without the history of clinical psychology. Uh, and clinical psychology is the uh, is the study of psychological disorders. And psychological disorders have, have a fairly sad history uh, because for, for hundreds, even thousands of years, uh, mental disorders were, were attributed to supernatural causes. So things like demonic possession, possession by ghosts or spirits, uh, even imbalance in bodily fluids, which, strictly speaking, isn't supernatural, but there's no evidence for it. Uh, and even the word lunatic, which we colloquially use to mean crazy person, uh, was a term meaning a person who's exhibiting the symptoms of a mental disorder by virtue of the phase of the moon, the moon's position influenced mental processes and behavior. And we now know all this not to be true, uh, but that was the explanation for a long time, and you'd have uh, all sorts of bizarre and painful responses to the mental disorder that didn't do anything to cure the patient. Uh, thankfully, that, was, that came to an end around the 1600s, uh, and you had the idea of institutionalization, which still by itself not pleasant, uh, but better than, tor rather than torturing uh, the sufferers of mental disorders, they were instead housed in a separate building with one another. And the conditions were generally not good. They were sort of minimal care, uh, but at least they weren't being uh, attacked anymore. Uh, 
and we'll go into more into this toward the end of the course, but there really wasn't much people could do for them at that time. They could be housed them, they could sort of take care of their basic needs, but there was no way of treating them. Uh, and so as recently as the 1900s, the early 1900s, you have a new emphasis on actually treating patients, trying to address their symptoms. And so clinical psychology uh, is very much about learning from dysfunction. If you take an individual who's suffering from a mental disorder or symptoms uh, uh, related to their mental processes, you can sort of learn about the mind and the brain by looking at what goes wrong. And, and one of the biggest names in clinical psychology is, of course, Sigmund Freud, who many of you have probably heard of. Uh, and he developed a field called psychoanalysis. Uh, which looks and really emphasizes unconscious processes. So the idea that our behavior uh, is really the result of unconscious desires, particularly sexual desires and urges. Uh, and while that view in particular has fallen out of favor, Freud's emphasis on the unconscious is still important. Uh, because frankly, where we aren't aware of a lot of the causes of behaviors. Uh, we're certainly not aware of all of our mental processes. So when you try to remember something, the information either appears or it doesn't. You don't really have insight into where memories come from, or you can't anticipate whether you're going to remember a piece of information or not. It just sort of shows up. And a lot of our mental processes are like that. Uh, your senses, for example. You're not aware of all the processing that happens before you have a perception, before you recognize an object. Uh, you're not aware of all the various components that your sensory information, your sensory systems, uh, send to the brain, you're just aware of being, of perceiving an object, for example. Uh, and so the idea of the unconscious, the importance of the unconscious, was a really big step, even if the emphasis on sex and sexual desires was not. So moving into the more modern era, the 20th century, uh, you have, for example, humanistic psychology, which really got emphasized in the, in the 60s. Uh, and this was a response to, to Freud's theories, because Freud's theories are these sort of dark, unconscious theories uh, about what drives human behavior, these, these repressed sexual urges, uh, repressed memories of childhood trauma. Uh, and the humanistic psychologists took a more positive view, saying that behavior isn't just the function of these dark drives that we don't have access to, much less control over, uh, that really people behave the way they do because they want to grow, they want to learn, they want to expand, they want to help other people. Uh, and, and so that more positive emphasis came out of the humanistic psychologists. It was an alternative viewpoint as to where behavior came from. Uh, also in the 20th century, you have the rise of behaviorism, which is a very important psychological theory. Uh, so starting with people like John Watson, uh, and, and by the way, you're starting to see more Americans now, John Watson, uh, G. Stanley Hall, William James, uh, these are the first Americans we've seen. They've been uh, European males up until now. Now we're starting to see some American males. Uh, so John Watson worked with animals. And he, when it came time to studying humans, uh, he said basically this, that we can measure environmental stimuli. We can measure behavioral responses. But all the mental processing in between, we don't really have access to. Uh, so, maybe you can introspect, but who knows how reliable that is. Uh, so let's not worry about all the inner workings of the mind, uh, and just focus on connecting the environment to behavior. Uh, and people like Margaret Washburn, who's the first woman we've seen in, in this lecture, uh, said, well, wait a minute, the mind's very important. Let's not just ignore that. Uh, and so behaviors have got some pushback immediately. Uh, Washburn also said that, that animals have minds. Uh, and that's a, that's a view that has been given more credence as time has gone on. Uh, no, the degree to which they have minds is up for debate. But there are many animals that seem to have feelings. Uh, there are animals that seem to be able to plan for the future, to reason, even to use tools. Uh, and, and so the idea that animals have minds of some sort or another uh, is again, becoming a more popular idea. Uh, but Watson really had heavily, heavy influence on B.F. Skinner, probably the most famous of the behaviorists. 
And and B.F. Skinner is one, is one of the most important psychologists, certainly of the 20th century. And so Skinner still placed an emphasis on observation. What can we observe? What can we measure? Well, we can measure environmental stimuli, and we can measure behavior. And let's not worry so much about the inner workings of the mind, what's going on inside that we can't access. Uh, and so Skinner wanted to connect stimuli and responses, stimuli being inputs from the environment, and responses being behaviors that are caused by those stimuli. Uh, and the idea here was that everything is a learning experience, that all of our behavior is a function of what we've experienced, what we've learned. So sort of going back to Aristotle's philosophical empiricism, uh, that everything we ever do is, is the product of learning, and in particular learning about the environment and getting what's kind of called reinforcement. If we, if we exhibit a behavior, that will either lead to a good consequence or a bad consequence, and will either increase or decrease the likelihood of that behavior later. So if something good happens, well, we'll try doing that again at some point. If something bad happens, well, maybe we don't do that ever again. Or maybe we do it less, at least. And so that's the idea of reinforcement, that a uh, behavior becomes more or less likely uh, as a function of what consequences the behavior has produced previously. Okay, so what we've seen so far is a trend over centuries uh, of psychology becoming more and more scientific. Uh, so what are some of the trends that we've seen as various people have approached psychology, trying to understand how the mind works, what produces behavior? Uh, well, one of these advances is materialism. Uh, and that is not in the sense of being materialistic, where you want a bunch of stuff. Uh, so it's not economic materialism. Uh, it's the idea that we are made out of matter. Our bodies are made out of matter. So, uh, our brains are made of, out, of, out of matter. Uh, and that it's really matter that's processing information, producing behavior. Uh, and so the idea that the brain is what produces the mind. Uh, and so, again, this, is, this was controversial. And in some circles still might be. Uh, but it at least gives us a basis for measuring things. If something's non-physical, if it's spiritual, then you can't really measure it. You can't have testable hypotheses. Uh, and so materialism, the idea that the brain and therefore the mind is made out of stuff that we can measure, uh, was a big move for psychology in terms of becoming a science. Uh, and as the importance of the brain became more and more obvious, uh, we've also developed techniques for measuring the brain. We'll get more into that next week. Uh, but looking at brain activity, measuring the structure of the brain, how the different parts communicate with one another, uh, has helped us understand how the brain functions, how it gives rise to behavior, how it processes sensory stimuli, and why we see the symptoms we do when something goes wrong, if something is uh, diseased in the brain, or some part of the brain is lost. Uh, there's been an increasing emphasis on observation over introspection. That is, on measuring something objectively, as opposed to asking people what's going on in their minds. Now, introspection still has its place, and it still goes on, uh, especially with, with things like emotion, where we can't access what someone is feeling. They have to tell us. Uh, or certain kinds of memory research. We have to know what people are, are remembering. So there are lots of areas of psychology that still depend on introspection, but there's a move toward measuring as much as we can, observing as much as we can, and only depending on introspection for those parts of mental function that we can't access. Uh, there's also been an increased emphasis on controlled experiments. Uh, so that is having multiple participants, for example, uh, giving certain stimuli and seeing what response they produce, measuring how well people learn, not just in their everyday lives, because that's very hard to uh, distill down into uh, findings and conclusions, uh, but you give people a controlled environment. That way you know what stimuli they're getting. You can measure what responses they give. Uh, and so the controlled experiment is a big step forward in psychological science. Now, you can't always control for everything, uh, but 
to the extent we can, just like we try to measure as much as we can, we also try to control the environment to the degree that we can. So these are all steps toward a more scientific process in terms of understanding the mind and how the mind produces behavior and which behaviors will be produced. Uh, okay, that will do it for this lecture. Uh, so next time, the second lecture this week, uh, we'll be looking at more modern psychology, so not as much ancient history uh, as modern history. So, as I mentioned, the increasing role of the scientific method. Uh, we'll see how that leveraged behaviorism, and behaviorism is not as popular as it once was, uh, and we'll see why. Uh, so we're also going to see that behaviorism, for all its positives, uh, ignoring, uh, ignored the mind. And the mind is really an important part of psychology. It doesn't just feel important. It actually is necessary to explain a lot of behavior. Behaviorism couldn't explain a, a lot of important behaviors. And so we're going to look at more specific, more complex functions uh, with, within the confines of the mind and see how a more scientific approach uh, really helped scientists and psychologists uh, look at those aspects of the mind uh, that have been sort of ignored by behaviorism. Uh, we'll also, in the last part of the lecture, uh, look at the profession of psychology, all the different careers that exist in psychology, uh, and all the different specializations that exist. Uh, so up through modern history, uh, psychologists say lots of different things, but uh, now their psychology is so huge that there are lots of different disciplines. Uh, and lots of different ways to be a psychologist. Uh, so we'll talk about that as well. Uh, and I will see you next time.